Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Hot Blooded. If you're new here, my name is Kat Jones, and this is my podcast where I talk to people about love, rock and roll, and anything that comes up along the way. If you're a longtime listener, you know that I've taken a very long break since the last episode, about six months, in fact, and I could launch into a very long explanation about why and everything that I've been up to, but I'd rather keep this super quick so that I can get to this episode's interview with my dear friend, Chris Esfandiari of King Woman, Miserable, Dalmatian, and about a hundred other projects, which she'll go into in more detail in a bit. But to briefly bring you up to speed and give you a quick rundown, when the pandemic hit, I was in New York, and my office for my day job was in Times Square, and I commuted there from my apartment in bed Brooklyn, and all over New York, it was an extremely intense and scary time when everything shut down, mostly because we had no idea what was going to happen. And there were constant ambulance sirens and everyone was completely isolated from one another. I went like days or weeks without seeing a human a few times. And I caught COVID at the end of March. And once I was completely healed up, I made the decision to go hang out in Northern California, where I'm from, to weather the pandemic with my family. And then when my lease in Brooklyn was up at the end of August, and it was looking like we were for sure not going to go back to the office anytime soon, I headed back to New York, I packed up all my shit, and I drove back across the country on this wild two-week road trip with my best friend, Liesl. And once I settled into the fact that I officially live on the West Coast again, it kind of hit me that I don't think that I have had the time or mental space to be able to slow down and enjoy life with my family in over a decade, which was wild to realize. And in such an utterly insane year with so much perpetual dread going on, both from the pandemic and politics, um, it seemed more important to me than ever to just forget my projects outside of work for a bit and spend some time caring for the people that I love. Anyway, once I slowed down and put my focus back into real life things, it became more important to me than ever to not return to this podcast until I was completely ready. You know, I can write about or interview musicians about their various new projects for my day job or, you know, produce metal shows about current events, no problem. But when you're dealing with stories about love and the most intimate stories of people's lives, it's imperative that you're in a space where you can handle them with the utmost care. And when I first did the first season of episodes of this podcast, I was overwhelmingly grateful that people opened up to me and shared such incredible stories with me. And to be honest with you, I don't think that I was fully prepared for the weight that comes along with delivering those stories in the best way possible while also facing my own life during the beginning of the pandemic. And at this point, I've probably been ready for a while, but I've also gotten a bit lazy (laughs) and needed a swift kick in the ass to keep going. So Chris Mondiari. And I have been talking about doing an episode of this podcast for like a year now. And she too found herself dealing with the onset of the pandemic in New York and various life situations that came along with it. So we put it off. But over the holidays, we found ourselves in the Sacramento area and we decided to hang out in Southside Park one day. At the end of our long chat, she said, we should do that episode sometime. (laughs) And I was like, you know what? fuck it, let's do it in my car right now. And she was like, hell yes, let's do it. So Chris kind of served as that kick in the ass for me to actually do this. And I'm so grateful to her, not only for her amazing music that she has inspired me with for many years now, but also as the catalyst to restart this podcast. So the following is our very off-the-cuff interview for which I prepared exactly zero questions beforehand, and I hope you enjoy a snapshot of an extremely spur-of-the-moment conversation about love and all the incredible wisdom that she has to offer.
We've been meaning to to have this conversation for a long time. And I feel like when we first talked about it, you were feeling like a little too vulnerable about talking about love. But it feels like we're we're both in a better place now to be talking about this kind of thing. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see. Um, Okay, so you have more projects than like anyone that I've ever met. You are one of the most prolific and incredible artists that I know, friend or not friend. (laughs) And one thing that has always been really incredible to me is that in every single one of your projects, the subject of love comes up, but it's all in completely different ways. So I guess before we go down that road, um, let's do a breakdown of like what your projects are. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. I'm sure that's like what everybody <laughs> asks you first. Yeah. But. So the main one is definitely King Woman. Would you say right? Mm, I mean, it's one of the first ones I started. They're all kind of, they're all pretty meaningful to me in their own. I don't like to say like one's more meaningful or like more important than the other. I think King Woman is just one of the first ones I started. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think a lot more people know about King Woman, but. They're all so important to me and I try to give them attention when I can, you know? So, you know, I recorded the King Woman album and then did all the press stuff for that. And then now I'm going to focus on the Dalmatian records, you know? So I just kind of take turns with all of them, so to speak. So Dalmatian is your new rap project. Yeah, it's, I started it last, uh, well, yeah, last year, early last year. And I have, I'm sitting on a few albums. I just haven't been able to finish them for some reason. It's just, I guess it isn't the right time. I've been kind of mixing them all on and off and I redoing all the vocals or I don't like how something sounds. So it's just taken a while for me to really uh, fully get the ideas together or get the songs complete. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's my rap project, I would say. And I'm really excited about that one actually i'm excited to put those records out whenever they are ready to come out whenever Um, they're done being incubated (laughs) yeah pretty much totally so there's king woman and dalmatian and then we have miserable which is your shoegaze project so yeah it's kind of like grungy it's just whatever like the next okay like the last one i did was kind of grungy sounded a little bit like hole or nirvana or something like that and then this one will be a little bit more like Bruce Springsteen, like Think Nebraska or something like that. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. But a little more modern. I'm super into that. Yeah. Kind of along the lines of How Damn to Love You is sounding. And um, I'm working on it with my really good friend, Emmett Kai, who I run a label with called Unisex in New York City. And yeah, pretty excited about that. He's an incredible artist and one of my favorite producers and also just really great at mixing. Like he's... He's just the best. I love him so much. Um, Did you work with him? Okay, so... He produced Damn to Love You. So Damn to Love You was the single that you put out at the beginning of 2020. It feels like 10 years ago now. Yes, what a year. (laughs) um, But that was just a single. And it it, it was like... It was a lot quieter and less... Aggressive. Yeah, less aggressive, less less intense than other miserable stuff has been. So is that kind of the direction that stuff is going to go in now? For this record, I feel like it changes. Like, I have a pretty incredible lineup for Miserable right now. Like, I have SG who SG and Jess, who play in Spare Parts for Broken Hearts, and they're just fucking so badass. And then I have, now I have um, NASA, who is also Persian and from Queens, super, super incredible bass player and singer. Um, she just does so many amazing things, but she's also playing with us. So we just have this badass lineup now and I'm excited to start working on stuff with them again. But for this record, yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit more, I don't want to say like folky or country or something like that, but kind of, kind of like that. Um, just cause that's what, what I'm feeling right now for that project mm-hmm. live. It's a, it, live. It's a lot more aggressive. Cool. When we all get together, it's a lot more aggressive. I really, really enjoy playing with them. And then you also have 
the project Sugar High, yeah. which is kind of like also shoegaze, but more electronic. Yeah, I'd say. it's kind of like... Yeah, so I met Darcy through my friend Will, who plays in Death Bells, and I was originally trying to book a show for Darcy, and then we met up, and we just kind of bonded, we kind of trauma bonded <laughs> by our childhoods, <laughs> and we were like, let's write some music, and then we went to my practice space, and I was like, no, let's make an album, and Darcy was like, yeah. <laughs> so then we made a record in literally like a week, Wow! and it was so beautiful, and just, we just felt like it was meant to be. And Darcy became one of my closest, closest friends. Um, but I, I w- we were both kind of modeling it off of um, Hurry Up, We're Dreaming by MA3. Mm. So, okay. King Woman, Miserable, Sugar High, Dalmatian. <laughs> um, Nightcrawler. And Nightcrawler is like your industrial project. <laughs> yeah, it's like noisy, industrial, like kind of breakbeat. Like. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And... Is there anything else that I'm forgetting right now? Like, I figured yeah. we should just, like, lay the groundwork before we oh, go God. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Wait, <laughs> let me look this up because I have so many. And I just... I love that you have a list in your phone of what projects you're working on. Oh, man, I have so many. And then me and Nick... Me and Nick and Nessa just started another one together, which I'm... My best friend Nick Zinner is, like... We just started another one together and not really even sure what that one's going to sound like, but we just decided we're doing it because... I don't know. We should just... Him and I needed to do a project together, so I'm glad it's happening. Okay, what else? Uh, Oh, wait. You also put out a single this year as just Chris. Yeah, yeah. That's my, like, R&B shit. Cool. Um, I want to do a a full length for that one. Um, And then I have Ick Boy, which is just, like, my producer name, I guess. It's kind of like house... Like, the record I'm going to do for that, or an EP I'm doing, is kind of house. I guess it's, like, house music. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still working on finishing that. I did a music video for it. Uh, and then I have, what else do I have? Man, I have so many fucking I'm just looking through this list. <laughs> so many that you can't remember oh, them all. Me, me and my friend Slugga just started a project called Gin and Juice, but it's amazing. Gin, like D-J-I-N-N. Uh, it's going to sound kind of like, fuck, how, how could I? I don't like what comparable to what, like, I don't fucking know what, like kind of G-Funk sounding, I guess. Cool. Um, and we have this single called Hellhound that we're going to put out with a video. I'm really excited about it. And then um, a part of this collective called Emerald Scar Circle, which is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a rap crew, I guess. Um, and we, I kind of just got involved with that. And I, I hope, I think we're hopefully going to do like a, re- hopefully do a record together with the few people that are in that. And then I have another thing that i just started as well but i don't have a name for it but i've been working on songs for it so god damn it's just i have so many ideas and they just people are like why don't you just do it under one project i'm like because i don't want to bitch this is just how i want to do it it's they're like well you would be more success i'm like i don't care this is my this is about my spiritual path and my journey and how i want to you know it's my way to you know show different parts of my personality and I don't know, act out different characters. I don't know. It's just like how I want to do things. And I feel like people have criticized me for like, why do you have so many, why don't you just do it like this? I'm like, cause that's just not what my heart is telling me to do. And I'm going to do things my way. One thing you do not ever want to do with me is tell me what to do. (laughs) That's literally the worst thing you can do. I did this thing called like, oh, what is it called? It's like a, it's this chart. How do I, what is, how do you say it? It's this chart that you, that reads your like personality type or how you function in the world. And I'm like a manifester. I like did this chart and it's like I'm 4% of the world population. One of the top ways it's like how you can love a manifester. Never tell them what to do. And I was like, word, that's definitely me. Well, that definitely makes sense. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I just have all these ideas and I constantly have new songs popping up in my head. And I just, I do it because I love music and I constantly have music flowing out of me. And I constantly want to be creating all the time. You know, I just get lost. I get lost in it. And who knows? Who knows what will happen next? I, I don't even know how many... <laughs> projects i'm gonna have well the beauty of the internet now is that if someone follows you then you're always going to tell people what you're working on so it's not like you have to only be following like one of the bands yeah like as long as you're following chris's social media you're going to hear about whatever project it is and you can buy it and you're going to get the link to it and so it's all still under the umbrella of like just you and your yeah totally and it's so much less about money and like success it's about my personal journey you know what I mean it's Mm -hmm. for me 
Like I, these are things that I feel compelled to do and I'm going to do them the way I want to do them. So I really don't like when people, you know, want to put in their two cents about how I'm doing things. Cause it's like, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. Yeah. You know, but it's a lot, you know, compartmentalizing. <laughs> you should see my phone. I just have like so many notes in my phone. I'm like, okay, I got to do this for this and make this video. And I got to put out this EP. And I'm like, okay, this is the timeline for all these. It's like, I don't know how you keep pretty, all that straight. It's pretty psychotic. I'm like, it's pretty lie. amazing. Yeah. I mean, you've made it work this long. Like, uh, it, it, <laughs> you're obviously very successful doing it. So whatever you're doing, it's working. Yeah. It's like, oh, you must really, really hate yourself, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you get an idea, like a musical idea, idea in your head do you already know that it's going to be a dalmatian song or that it's going to be a night color song oh, yeah. or like do you oh yeah so you just like it just comes out and you're like i'm gonna write a night crawler song today or do are you just hear it and you're like i oh, can that's hear gonna fit like under this full thing. i can hear i have like complete albums mapped out like night crawler i already have like four albums i want to release wow it just the music comes out so fast i, I have the vision I usually know the album covers, the type, what the title of the, I have all of it. It's just, I have it all like in different sections of my brain. I know exactly what I want to do for each record, when I want to put it out, what I want to do next. But it just constantly, it's constantly coming out. I have too many ideas. It's like, I can't stop the ideas from coming. So it's like, what am I going to do besides have a million fucking projects or whatever you want to call them? You know, it's, I just don't know what else to do with it. I love creating. I really do. I've tried to take breaks from music. I've tried to I've tried to be like fuck music, fuck the music industry, but at the end of the day, I really just fucking love music and I I love helping other artists. It really is my passion. I've tried so hard. Like sometimes it pisses me off so much like the shit I have to deal with in the music industry and I be like I'm not doing this anymore and it's like yeah, fucking right. <laughs> You're right. gonna do it. You can take breaks anytime you yeah, want. I try we'll to. I try to, but I can't. I really can't. There's just too much I want to do. I, yeah. If I took a break, I would just be buried. <laughs> I really just, <laughs> I feel like I really just want to get out, get as much um, expression out as possible before I leave this planet. It's like, that's why I, I just feel this urgency to to do it now. I'm just like, I need to, I have to express all that I want to express in this lifetime. And I just don't know how long I'll be here, you know? Right. So many ideas, so many songs, so many albums. So it's taking a break wouldn't really make sense for me. I don't really, yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So you know how a song is going to sound and how, and like what project it's going to be under or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, like um, whatever filter you're putting it out through in your mind. Yeah. But it seems to me that <clears throat> with every project, they all tell different stories too. Oh yeah. And like when it comes to the concept of love, I feel like especially there's like different angles that you come at it in each project. Like when I listen to a miserable song, it's like the anguish of like the pain of being in love or like the breakups and all that stuff. And then like something else would be more aggressive or something else would be like the throes of like the, the pleasure of being in love or whatever. So how do you, do you have like a certain character in, how do I want to phrase this? Like, do you feel like, each character that you take on when you do these roles expresses love differently or tells different stories about love? I'm never really coming at it. I'm never really thinking at, about it um, through the lens of love. It's just whatever I feel compelled to s s say in the moment. I guess a lot of, a lot of songs just relate back to love because love is kind of everything, right? Right. So, um, I'm never like, I'm going to write a love song right now. I feel like I don't know. I'm a v my Venus is in Aries, so it's just like high octane, baby. Like, <laughs> and I am an Aries, so yeah, no wonder we're friends. I, mean, I have a lot of placements in Aries, and just it's a lot of fire. It's a lot of passion. So I've heard, God help anybody who's dated me, <laughs> <laughs> been in love with me. <laughs> uh, it's just a lot. So I've got a lot of I've got a lot of love, and if I love you. God help me. God help me. <laughs> There's no escape. There's really no escape. Um, and so, the um, the Sugar High album was called Love Addict. So how did that come about? Well, well me and Darcy are both <laughs> me and Darcy are both diagnosed um, codependent love addicts. So that's kind of how that came about. We both have like PTSD and shit. So we, I think we were talking about therapy. Or he's diagnosed one. Of, he's diagnosed with one of them. I'm diagnosed like my therapist Julie fucking god i love her so much julie you're the best um 
she pro- I finally probably got diagno- diagnosed and I have um, complex com- bleh, complex PTSD and a codependent love addict, um, which I've been able to work through a lot of that stuff and mostly just by being alone, you know, uh, like I like being by myself a lot and I think it's it's less triggering for me honestly Mm -hmm. uh but it was it was nice to get properly diagnosed for the first time in my life like when I read the um description of complex PTSD I cried because I was like oh my god this is what I have like I didn't couldn't figure it out my whole life and I read that and I was like whoa this is massive but um circling back around to me and Darcy I think we had a conversation and I was like yo so I'm a I'm a love addict and he was like oh me too so I think that's how that I think that's how that came about we're just we have similar similar trauma oh I love Darcy so much his music is so so incredible love you Darcy so when you guys were writing that record what were kind of the themes that you were working with when you're telling the stories in those songs I mean I think we were kind of channeling our angsty teens that we didn't really get to express when we were younger. You know, mm-hmm. I think we both had kind of um, really abusive, toxic home environments and like had to grow up fast or stuff down our feelings. We we're both like very angsty people, especially when we were younger. And to me, we were kind of like when we were together, it felt like we could be angsty teenagers together. And I mm-hmm. think that's kind of the angle we were telling the story from. Like the last song. um, is the lyrics are nauseous gotta quit habit i can't kick makes me sick and it's talking about like being a love addict um so also it's a little it's about like it can be related back to like other addictions as well you know Mm -hmm. both struggled with that and um i don't know i feel like that record was very a lot of people really related to that record it resonated with a lot of people i got a lot of messages about that one and it's very it's just a very special record for me like It was just such a divine album. Like, we didn't even really try. The songs just kind of happened so naturally. I literally just met him, and we're in my practice space. It's like, okay, let's make a record. Fuck it. And he's in Australia, so it's a little bit hard. You know, I want to do another record with him, but I think we're going to start with, like, a single and go from there. I don't know. It was a very, very very personal record, you know? It was a very Mm -hmm. vulnerable record to write. Um, Yeah. Yeah, there's a song on there. I forget what it's called, but you talk about falling asleep next to your phone. Someone said that they were going to call you yeah, and yeah. they didn't. And yeah. then you're like, you wake up and there's still no missed call from yeah, them. Yeah, you're like, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been there. We've all been where there. We're just like, I know that I should put up a boundary and be like, I'm going to sleep right now. So you can talk to me tomorrow. Yeah. But it's like, no, I'll just I'll just put my phone next to my pillow. No, and just like, someone playing you, you know, someone just toying with your emotions and manipulating you is essentially what that's yeah like keeping you on the hook Mm -hmm. but never actually like wanting to put forth the effort to making it happen just somebody who's emotionally unavailable essentially we've all been there (laughs) for real yeah awful (laughs) (laughs) some of the greatest art ever created has been created as a result has has any great art ever been created from like happiness i don't i don't know (laughs) god i can't think of any right now but it's like (laughs) Man, so intense. So, okay, then let's move on to Miserable. So I remember the first Miserable song that I, like, ever fully fell in love with, I think, was Oven. And I love... <laughs> the Sylvia that... Plath reference. Oh, really? <laughs> Is that... I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, he... he... Says he doesn't, he doesn't care. care. I guess he, he doesn't, doesn't stick, stick my, my head, head in an oven. oven. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was Sylvia Plath. Okay, so tell me about that. No, it's just Bell Jar was one of my favorite um, favorite books. Well, she she killed herself by sticking her head in an oven. That's right. Um, yeah, I really want to remake that song because it was kind of poorly recorded. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about that song or just that album. I feel like that album had so much anguish in it. It just yeah, like it was... when I listen to it now, I can feel it. Like I, I end up in a different mood after I listen to that record. No matter what mood I'm in, I feel like I can feel what you were going through. And like yeah. maybe that's just me projecting onto it. But no, I'm I yeah that record. It's definitely special. I, I think it. I w- I really want to re-record that whole album, but um, I think it sounds weird. great. I think yeah. you're being too hard on yourself. I'm definitely hard on myself. Uh, yeah. So I what was... were you going through when you wrote that? Oh, don't want to say too much, but 
We don't have to go I personal. Was, we can uh, go like I was in abstract. A, I was in a band with some people that five different people that I thought were like my closest friends. And um, that relationship ended and I felt very betrayed and I toured the world with them. And it was hard because me and the main person in the band were both, he had like an alcoholic mom, really bad alcoholic mom. And I was dating an alcoholic, just a gnarly drunk. Um, and so when we would tour together, we kind of both related on that tip and we got really, really close. And, um, it's kind of about the betrayal of, of those relation five relationships I, I had with those people that I was in a band with. Um, I didn't sleep pretty much at all. When I worked on that record, I was like hallucinating. It was a really, really sad, sad time in my life. Um, there's like a voicemail at the end of the record of like them, them all yelling on a voicemail trying to call me before like band practice I like put that at the end of the record I don't know if anybody would notice but it's been so long since since I've been in that band that it's, I feel like it's fine to talk about it but yeah it's mainly about like my relationship with the main the main person in that project because they really inspired they were like the kind of the, kind of the catalyst for uh, me becoming a musician and an artist like they were always creating all the time and inspired me so much and were kind of one of the reasons that I, I started doing so much music. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of a lot of it is about them and the effect that they had on me. Like they really were the reason that I the, they were the person that sparked my desire to be the artist that I am. It was like I started miserable and King Woman just watching how much music they were always making. And I was like, I just resonated with that. I was like, I need to be doing this because at the time I was just like, working a shitty job in San Francisco, living with my drunk cocaine addict boyfriend, just being like, is this all there is in life? Is this my fucking future forever? And then I like made a Craigslist ad and I was like, I want to play music. Like these are the bands I like. And then this band hit me up on Craigslist. And then I started just like pretty much fucking touring the world with them. Immediately. Wow. And that kind of gave me some purpose, you know, everything, I guess, was that like really intense to go from not having a band at all to suddenly having that intense of an experience? I was ready. I was so fucking over my life. I was just like, I know I'm meant for something greater than what I'm doing right now. You know, working mm -hmm. some shitty job, dating this fucking person who can't get their shit together. You know, it was, it sucked. I was just living in, in San Francisco. We lived below like our crackhead landlords, literally crackheads. Um, the wife would like try to open my sliding door to my house and like threatened to kill me. She like took a karaoke machine and flipped it over. Like, in, like the, our kitchen was right above theirs. And like, she flipped it over and was singing to like the tune of a cranberry song. Like, I hate you. You're a fucking slut. Oh my God. I'm going to kill you and your dog. I'm not making this up. Like, <laughs> that's the kind of shit I was dealing with. So Jesus. I had nothing going for me. I knew that I was here to do something special, but I couldn't figure it the fuck out. I was in this relationship with this person who just didn't have the shit together. And our life looked really perfect on the outside. Like, good looking couple, cute dog, you know, cute place. Like, everything looked good on the outside, but I was so fucking sad and just like had, I just feel like I had no purpose in life. And so I feel like that being in that band really did did help me in a lot of ways. And it showed me my destiny as an artist. So I'm grateful for that, you know. I don't really regret any of it, but at the time I was really sad when that, when the, those friendships ended. So that's mostly what that, what that record is about. If people ask me, people, I get messages all the time. People asking me what that record's about actually. So it, it's funny. I don't know if it's funny. It's interesting that it's not about a person that you were in a romantic relationship with. Cause it feels like when I you mean, listen that, to that I record, guess it could have been considered, it was, yeah, it was kind of romantic in a way. It was definitely intimate. We had a deep love for each other, you know, we never, mm -hmm. we never kissed or anything, but, um, I think we did. I think we were in love with each other for sure. Just nothing ever happened between us. It was just kind of, I don't know. It could have never been between us essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing that sometimes, sometimes the greatest love stories are not necessarily ones that you acted on. No, they're just exactly. like ones that there's some sort of chemistry involved that affects your life. Yeah. It changed my life forever. This, this person definitely changed affected my life forever. One of the few people that I, uh, I would say really inspired me to become the artist that I am. Wow. Yeah. That's really fascinating to have that perspective on that record. Yeah. Um, 
Why am I blanking on the name of the record right now, by the way? Uncontrollable. Uncontrollable. Yeah. Man, the song Uncontrollable yeah. is incredible. So thank you. <laughs> what what was the inspiration for that particular track? Oh, it was just kind of like I don't know. I guess it's just like advice. It's never <clears throat> never cover your heart with shelter. Um wear it in, wear it thin, don't be afraid to live. Those are the lyrics. That's like the opening track. Um, I, I guess it's also about the fact that you can't really control who you love. Mm-hmm. You know, your heart, your heart loves who it loves. Sometimes that sucks. I would say most of the time that sucks. <laughs> yeah, you get those special, special occasions where it's it's mutual and, and the timing is right. I feel like timing is everything with love. It really is so huge. You got to be in the right, right place, right mindset, or else it can be really devastating. You know. How many times would you say that's happened to you in your life? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean that exact like right place, right time. Like this is oh, the right, right place, person. right time. Oh, you know. Yeah, I had a really good relationship with um, with an ex. It wasn't it wasn't a very long relationship, but I just like met them. They were driving for my tour, and I just like met them, and we just saw each other from across the room, and it was just like this moment where I was like, we had such a I could just feel our connection, and it it was a really beautiful short lived relationship, and I still have really fond memories of this person, and like we're still good friends. But can I genuinely say, I can't really genuinely say I've been in love with more than like one person in my life like truly truly in love like I thought I thought that these relationships were love and I guess I guess they were at the time Mm -hmm. but they always turned into like friendships or we ended up hating each other or someone cheated on me or you know right you know so I think timing is is very very important especially as you get older and I don't know if someone's not in a good headspace or they just broke up with somebody or they're moving somewhere and you're are there, are there so many, there's so many factors, right? Yeah. It's huge. Timing is huge. It's a huge, huge portion, portion of why people end up together or why they don't, right? Right. Yeah. Most of the time, why they don't. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time, why they, oh my God. Tell me like what? 80%, 85%? Uh, tell me about it. It's just like, yeah. Most of the time love has just like annihilated me or my idea of love has just like completely annihilated me, especially yeah I w- I've been in love with the same person for like over three years now and that just like killed me is it still yeah. how, how profoundly is it affecting you like right now pretty pretty bad <laughs> yeah it's pretty bad and that's the person that damned love you is about mm-hmm. that song when I listen to it it feels like it just like came out of you is that true? Yeah, for sure. Woo. You know how there's just like certain, I don't know, just like sometimes you can just hear a song and you just, you just know that person didn't spend a month on this. Like no, this came out no. usually, in a moment of passion. They usually come out pretty, pretty quick. I don't really spend too much time working on a song if it feels for. Sometimes I'll come back to things if I feel like it's worth it, but I feel like it should pretty much flow. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it's a good song, it should just kind of flow out of you. It shouldn't be too fractured or like hard to, it shouldn't be contrived. So yeah, you know, my music comes from my heart always. I live from my heart, which I don't know, sometimes that's not always a good thing, but I try to live from my heart and live honestly and as real as possible. But yeah, that's, that's a heavy one. I think that because you live your life so honestly and vulnerably and you allow, you like, you authentically allow yourself to be involved in so many of these situations. You inspire other people through the art that you create as a result of these situations. Yeah. And that's a really incredible, powerful thing that you have like soundtracked other people's breakups and there are other I get messages <laughs> about this all the time. I'm just really, like, 
Yeah, people tell me, you know, all sorts of cool things. They'll be like, oh, I got through my abortion or my miscarriage listening to a song that really to me has nothing to do with that. Wow. But for them, it's, you know, or my, you know, my dad just died of cancer. I was listening to this record. It's it's beautiful to hear those things. It's not really why I do it, but um, it's nice to know that people relate to what you're doing. And when you're doing such a vulnerable thing, you know, and sharing your music with the world, I just feel like I need to share this these stories and these gifts with the world. I don't know. I don't know what else to do with them, but you know, getting messages like that, it's like, Oh, that's kind of cool. That's really knowing cool. That, it's kind of cool knowing that people relate to, to what I'm doing, but it's also, you know, you put out a beautiful song and you're like depressed after you put it out. You're like, yeah, I'm still, still going through that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm like still crying myself to sleep every night over that person. I'm glad you liked the song, I guess. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. It's like not, and you know, Sometimes people don't, I guess something else we could talk about is just, I don't know, learning what love is and experiencing love for the first time. I, I feel Yeah. Like, tell me about like what, what happened the first time you ever fell in love? I wouldn't say the first time I ever fell in love, but I would say the first time I realized what love was, um, was when I was in my twenties. Like I'd been in relationships before. I'd been in a four-year relationship. I, I had parents, I had siblings, but I, I never really fully feel like I experienced love, like someone really loving me mm -hmm. until I was in my 20s. I feel like I really didn't understand what love was until I met my um, one of my best friends, Maria. Um, and I was with that partner of, of four years and just so miserable. And I remember drinking a bottle of wine after like one of my first King Woman shows. And I was just like, fuck this, fuck my life. She came down in the basement and she was like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like crying. I was like, I fucking hate my life. And this is going on. I met her maybe, I had met her maybe twice. Wow. And I, I, I just was venting to her and she was like, yeah, your partner sucks. She was like, you should come live with me. Like I was working a shitty job and I just felt trapped. Mm -hmm. She was like, you should come live with me. And I was like, you don't even know me. She's like, I'm going to know you. She's like, come live with me and get the fuck out of that relationship. Like you're so cool. You deserve more in life. Wow. And she just like took me in basically I I ended things with that person it was really hard and I moved in with her and I was honestly not very nice I wouldn't say I was nice I I didn't know what love was at all and she just would make me breakfast and try to hang out with me and I was so antisocial and just fucked up and her consistency um and like tenacity she just she just kept being kind to me and like very open and vulnerable and like eventually one day it just clicked for me I was like it was like my whole life I had not known what love was. And then she did that, all this kind stuff for me all the time. And after a certain amount of time, something just computed. And I was like, love, this is love. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was really, I remember just being looking at her and being like, you love me. And she's like, yeah. That's and incredible. And it was just like, that was like the first time in my life I had felt love. Like really, not even a relationship, like fucking somebody every day and living with them like you can do that and still not know what love is you can have parents that seem like they love you but really it's just like some toxic bullshit like I think parents do the best they can but I mean a lot of them are just like let's have kids and project all our shit onto them right and it's like you think you know what love is but a lot of it's just fucked up and toxic and they don't even know how to love so you don't even sometimes you never learn love from your family members and they might have experienced that with their parents too so yeah. they might not even know so the many difference. people so many people that don't know what love is and don't know how to love and I I think that the, r the person that I've been super devastated by the past few years, I don't feel that I don't feel that they have ever really experienced love. And I that's devastating when you really want to love someone and they just don't know how to receive it or th they don't know how to give it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people know how to take, but knowing how to give a I think a lot of people don't know how to t receive love either. Yeah. They don't know either or. And it's like a, there are a lot of people walking around. They never experienced love in their in their whole life. And some of them never will. But hopefully, hopefully they they meet that one person that really gets in there and, and shows them what love what love is. And sometimes it's not romantic. Sometimes it is. Mm -hmm. But my first experience with love was Maria. And I have her name tattooed on me. <laughs> and I saw her a few weeks ago. Um, she just got a big heart. But, you know, some if you're lucky enough in life that sometimes people come into your life and show you what love is and she did that for me and I'm super grateful for that and you know after that I was able to show lovers and friends what love was as well and some people get it in this lifetime and sometimes sometimes they never do because they're so hurt and damaged and they just can't really connect with that but it's it's really hard when you love somebody and and they can't really they don't know how to show you love in return and not that that's why you do it but um 
I think this year has been about like learning how to accept and let go for me, you know, because mm-hmm. I kind of stopped talking to the person that I really love. Do you feel like slowing down and being in quarantine and not being able to tour and stuff like that has given you the space and time to focus on that? Yeah, it's hard for me to slow down, to be honest. It's really hard for me. I just, um, my brain's kind of always has so many ideas. It can be kind of tormenting at times. And even when things are slow, it's never really slow up there. So Mm -hmm. I try to meditate and take care of myself, but it's pretty hard sometimes for me most days, to be honest. Um, yeah, I've just had to accept some things. It's been a, it's been a really interesting year. It's not like, I I mean, I'm usually at home, like I'm kind of a homebody working on music anyway. So I guess quarantine hasn't been that different for me, but it's been kind of fucking crazy. Like going to the protests, I had like, I was held at gunpoint for protecting like a black person that was being racially profiled. Like there was some crazy shit that happened during the pandemic. I was alone, um, and dealing with like, I stopped talking to the person I love during during the pandemic, so I just couldn't handle it because it was just, just fight too much, and um, just needed to take care of my mental health. I was far away from my family. I was in New York, like I only had like two close friends around, and it was just like really crazy time. And I just really needed, felt like I needed to like protect myself and take care of myself and figure some shit out for myself. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can only control yourself. You can only work on yourself. You can't force other people to learn shit or get their shit together, or go to therapy. You really can't. If, if people want to want to like take care of themselves and work through shit, then they're going to do that in their own time. And the only person that you can take care of and that you can control is you, you know, and your emotions. So I've been trying to work on just taking care of myself, putting myself first and loving myself during this time and letting go. Um, just a lot of, I guess you would, what you would call karmic lessons this mm-hmm. year. A lot of endings, a lot of beginnings. I learned a lot about um, you know, just, I'm really trying to heal like some of the codependent stuff because the fact that I'm an empath and have these codependent tendencies really attracts narcissistic people into my life. It's kind of like they're opposites, but they're kind of the same, right? Narcissists and empaths. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're not the same at all, but they're kind of the same and they kind of need each other and play off of each other. So two sides of the same coin. Exactly. Sometimes. Exactly. So there have been, I just feel like I'm constantly running into the same, the same lesson. And it's like these vampiric type of personalities that take, take, take. But then you have to stop and look at yourself and be like, okay, how am, what am I doing that is causing these people to even be allowed to come near me? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's been a really, really big lesson for me. It's like, what am I doing that all these motherfucking vampires really want to be up (laughs) on me right now? I need to change my shit because that's all I can change is me. What do you feel like you have changed? Just boundaries, saying, just saying no just respecting myself more. I I think sometimes I'm just like so sensitive and I want to like help everybody and overextend myself. And now I'm like, no, not everybody deserves my kindness and my support. I only have limited, a limited amount of energy. Like I really love connecting people and helping people as much as I can, you know, I, because I feel like people don't do that enough in this, in this world. It's like people with massive amounts of success and resources, like, okay, well you should share the wealth and help everyone around you. And a lot of people don't even fucking think to do that. But I try to like connect people and help people. Um, But sometimes people will just take and take and take and take advantage of that. So that's been a huge lesson for me this year. I just, I don't want any, I've kind of gotten rid of all the vampiric um, energies around me this year, which has been a really, really um, painful, hard lesson for me this year. I think it's probably the biggest lesson I learned. I can't be so kind and um, overextend myself to people that don't deserve my kindness because Mm -hmm. some people are just, some people will just literally use you and they don't even care about your well-being, you know? Right. And But that's my responsibility. Especially in the music reckon. industry. Oh, man. You don't have to fucking tell me twice, baby. Um, <laughs> but to everyone uh, listening. Yeah. Uh, the music industry. Know, run far, far, far <laughs> away. Music industry. If you hate yourself, you should be a, a musician. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a huge lesson this year. And they say there are like three types of love. There's like karmic, the karmic love, which is like painful and lessons and... Uh, you know, who knows if any of this is actually true, but and then they say there's like twin flame, which is the person who's the other half of you and you have an intense psychic connection. You don't, you don't always en- end up together, but you learn so much about yourself and they kind of mirror you. And then they say there's a soulmate, which is the person you generally end up with. And as my therapist says, a soulmate is someone, um, or the person you should end up with should be someone who feels very safe. And a lot of the time 
healthy relationships seem very boring and safe, which I don't know if I will ever end up in one of those. <laughs> I'm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I don't know that you can categorize all of these things into these into these words, but um, some of it makes sense to me that uh, like to frame it that way. It makes sense to me. I feel like that's a big thing. That's a big problem. A lot of people have is that when you do experience safe, healthy love, a lot of times it is, it does first seem boring because it's not tumultuous. It's not what you're used to. If you're used to like toxic behavior, we act out our, like we act out our childhood wounds. Right. So we recreate what we saw our parents doing. Right. So how do we, how do we get through that? And create excitement with the happy safe love (laughs) you tell me baby i have not figured that one out god damn it chris i wanted you to tell me (laughs) i definitely i don't know if i even want that to be honest like i don't know i i really like being by myself to be honest like i met somebody that i really fell in love with and i would have been happy to be with them but i really enjoy being by myself i think i thrive being by myself i feel really at peace mentally when i'm by myself i don't have to worry about somebody else because you know being in a relationship is no joke. People sometimes just dive into relationships. They're like, oh, this person's hot and we get along. Let's be in a relationship. It's like, bro, being in a relationship, like a real relationship is commitment. It's really not for the weak, the weak of heart, I yeah. will say. It's really not. Like if you're really going to do it. Um, yeah, if you're ready to like work on yourself you and gotta show work, your own wounds. Yeah, and, you like, cannot <laughs> be a fucking, you can't, you cannot go into that shit just like, oh, whatever. It's like, that person's going to mirror you. They're going to trigger you. You're going to have to work on your shit. You have to be ready for that shit. And that's why a lot of people, you know, they're afraid of it or they run away from it or they say they can't commit or they're emotionally unavailable. I totally get it. You know what I mean? You got to, mm-hmm. and it's, it's about timing too. So it's like, it's not a joke when you get with somebody, it's like, it's, it's real shit, you know, unless you're just trying to hook up and make it casual. But like, for the most part, if you're in a committed relationship, you also have to consider somebody else's life and their feelings and you have to like learn how to communicate and be vulnerable and be intimate you know so I get why people are kind of skittish about relationships like especially in New York like good luck good luck dating in New York (laughs) dating scene in New York let's just say that I did not have any success with that in the two years (laughs) I lived there let's just say neither did I (laughs) I mean I wasn't even oh my god I wasn't even trying dude I don't that shit's scary the New York dating scene is just like it's like, yeah, my primary partner and my five other partners, like, I don't even know what's going on there. Every time I would go out, it'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm in a polyamorous relationship. And then it seems like the partner doesn't know they're in a polyamorous relationship. It's just like some crazy situations yeah. I found myself in. And I'm like, I'm not about this shit. I definitely noticed that cheating is just kind of a lot more prevalent and just like accepted in New York even really? if even if the partner doesn't know about it like everyone else in that person's life knows about it because when you leave your house in New York you don't come back home for like 12 hours it's not like a normal town where you just like no. oh I'm gonna pop home really quick and like change totally. or, so when you leave you're seeing hundreds and hundreds or, or maybe thousands of other people in your yeah, day totally and you can easily just like have a little affair and then go back home to your family. And I feel like, I feel like I heard stories about that all the time. Like it was just an open accepted thing in New York. That's just like people have their safe relationship and then they go get their excitement elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I've heard so many crazy stories and had my own experiences in New York. When I, when I first moved to New York, I was, um, definitely not monogamous I was not into that I was like whoa I'm in New York baby <laughs> whoa, I'm dating everybody but um I don't know I feel like as I've gotten older I'm more like sensitive to like exchanging energy with people yeah, I'm just like too. I'm like I don't know what the fuck you're about I'm not trying to go on go out with these randos and like fuck randos it's right. just maybe I will again someday but right now where I'm at I'm very like closed off I'm just like I don't know what you're about I'm not trying to open my energy to anybody pretty much and I'm really enjoying just like keeping my energy to myself and being by myself. It's been really wonderful. I think New wonderful. York is a perfect place for that because if you're going to New York, it's because you have a dream and you want to make that happen and you're like a go-getter that's there for a reason. Yeah. And I think a lot of people just go there knowing like I'm here to chase that and any other thing like a relationship or dating or fun is like secondary to my dream. Yeah. So you get a lot of people who are just like, well, I would commit, but I am... 
I'm focusing elsewhere right now. Yeah, totally. Or it's I, I also feel like New York's kind of a place is it's where people go when they've already established themselves. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I feel like L.A. is more the place where you're like trying to make it, you know, and a lot of yeah, wannabes, a lot of hustlers, and, yeah, a lot of wannabes, <laughs> a lot of insecure people. Yeah, it's, I don't know. These are all generalizations, but right. it's fun to talk about, you know, yeah. like the experience of dating in New York. Also, people like us who have lived in so many different places. It's interesting God. to see the different patterns of like what you observe and what you hear about and what oh you my experience. God. Also in being in the city. music industry, it's like, yeah, that's really going to work out. Um, just like a mostly mentally unstable people that are artists like let's all date each other sounds fucking great it's gonna be a total success for real you know what I mean it's like yeah that was a good idea I'm gonna write so many songs about you <laughs> yeah. god fuck do you think that if you ever got to the point where you were experiencing that safe healthy love that you would still find enough stuff to write songs about oh I have so much material I'm not really looking for, I don't know. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm not really looking for, I, I think, I think I just need to find safety within myself first. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that the person you end up with is always, always the safe person. I don't think it's the same for everybody. I think sometimes you end up with a really mentally unstable person or, you know, somebody that's nothing like you or somebody that you really need to work out your childhood shit with, you know, not everybody ends up with the safe person. It's not everybody's story, but Mm -hmm. I, I will always have things to write about. I have so much music to make. I have so many records that I'm just shelving right now because I have to like finish another album cycle or something, you know, there's just so, so much music. So it doesn't really have anything to do with that. It's just very, very rare that I meet somebody that really speaks to my soul. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I met somebody a few years ago, this person that I've been wrapped up with. It's plaguing your mind right now. No, not plaguing. I love them so much. But um, no, it's just like I met them and I was like, me and my best friend Isaac talked about this because he, he had a similar situation where he just met that person. And it's like you meet them and you feel them and you just like have this moment where you're like, you know, you're like, oh, fuck. It's like when I saw him and met him I was like oh fuck this is gonna be some shit like I knew I knew it was gonna be some shit and Mm -hmm. it was some shit and it still is some shit for me at least you know but I think at the end of the day it's about you know I was also talking to my friend Laura about this she's like an amazing artist she lives in Canada she's from Russia so fucking incredible Laura Zombie everybody look her up um but we were talking we talk about love and um she's really reframed the idea of pain for me and just how devastating love can seem. But at the same time, if you want, if you frame it um, differently, it can be really beautiful. Even when it's, even when it totally crushes you and when it annihilates you, it's still fucking beautiful. So that's something I've learned from her. And she, she always says this quote, she says, I didn't, what is it? I didn't come here to teach, to teach you. I came here to love you and love will teach you. And I always think that's mm. so beautiful. She's that so sweet. That is a really beautiful quote. It's so beautiful. It's like, we came here to love each other and that's all it really is at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So she's taught me a lot recently about love and the beauty of loving somebody, even if they can't um, meet you where you are. That's been a huge lesson as well, but she's been a little angel in my life and we've been talking about love a lot and what we think about love and how painful it can be um, loving people in the wrong time or like when they're not where you are essentially you know it's really painful but yeah you can only like I said you can only control yourself and you have to learn how to let go and accept things for what they are and let people do what they're going to do and be who they're going to be and you know you can always hope for the best but at the the end of the day it's all it's all good and it's all love if not Mm -hmm. tell me about the first time you ever broke up with someone (laughs) <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I don't know fuck oh my god I, my first time I ever broke up with someone fuck I don't even remember who did I break up with oh my god I was dating this awful awful person when I was super young they had like a crazy crazy porn addiction and would shower like four times a day they were just like poor soul they were so they were so tormented but I found out from a friend that they were like looking up girls skirts and like (laughs) hitting on girls when we were dating oh god and I called them and yelled at them on the phone and broke up with them 
And then they were just like constantly trying to get me back for years, like oh, constantly talking about me years, years later, like six, seven years later. And I was just like, oh my God, fucking give it a rest. That was the first time I broke up with someone. I yelled at them on the phone, broke up with them. Very dramatic. That is dramatic. It's so dramatic. Also, what a dramatic reason to have to break up with somebody. Yeah, just so, just being shitty. But, you know, you're so young. It's like, who fucking cares? People do what the fuck they want to do at all times. Yeah. You know, people want to cheat on you or they don't think you're worth it. They're going to fucking do that. Got to. Everybody's going to do what the fuck they want to do. Just find somebody who you trust and who you can make it work with. Because it's a crazy world. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> so we talked earlier about sugar high and miserable um but i feel like with nightcrawler king woman and um your rap project dalmatian you are so much more in your power in those bands mm-hmm. like it's not it's, it's not, not as vulnerable, vulnerable. yeah yeah, yeah. It's so just a different tell me aspect. about that like when you're writing a dalmatian song mm-hmm. what is what's the concept generally well dalmatian is supposed to be like <laughs> i'm working on a comic for dalmatian uh Dalmatian is like um, a manslaying entity that fuses with a girl's body who got gang raped. It's like this. I'm working on this whole comic. But um, yeah, Dalmatian's like an entity that kills kills bad men, basically, like rapists and um, abusers. So, I mean, I haven't rolled out. The patron saint of people who need you. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, So, you know, I have a bunch of videos and concepts I'm working on for that. Uh, So... I don't know. I kind of write from that place, I guess, you know, kind of like a guardian in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and Nightcrawler is, uh, how do I put this? I don't know. Yeah. Nightcrawler is basically, mm, I don't want to say too much because I'm working on some stuff that I'm going to release. Okay. I don't know how to, I don't know how to word it without giving it away. You can just be like, pass. <laughs> pass, yeah, I'll say pass, pass, yeah. I got some cool videos coming out with my uh, with my dear friend, um, Jenny Hensler, and my and my friend Nathan. They have um, a production company called uh, Blue Lotus, and they're just incredible. They It was just so magical working with them on these Nightcrawler videos. I'm super excited about. So, yeah, you'll see those in a few months. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about King Woman. So, I guess... When I listen to King Woman, I feel like it's not necessarily as directly related to love as the other projects tend to be. Um, but, yeah, what are you generally writing about with King Woman? Uh, for me, King Woman is like ancestral work. It's just an energy. It's hard to explain. I'm very, like, connected to the earth and, like, to my bloodline, my Iranian bloodline when I'm when I'm um, channeling for that project, I feel. But sometimes things about love do come up. Like, mm-hmm. the new King Woman record definitely has aspects of that in it as well i feel like love is just everywhere it's kind of you can't you can't really avoid it yeah love is like ubiquitous and inescapable exactly totally and affecting every other part of your life so yeah it would be crazy for it not to come up yeah exactly yeah it's like um i guess all the projects are spiritual work for me as well it feels a lot of like reclaiming who you are and like Mm -hmm. like especially your live like uh persona mm-hmm. when you're like running into the crowd and like yelling in people's faces and mm-hmm. getting really really like confrontational and aggressive and i love how uncomfortable it makes men like, <laughs> it's always very they're like oh god what she, oh some she, of them she picked like, me <laughs> no some of them are like yeah punch me in the face baby like some of them really love it i'm not i guess i just you know it's not even that i'm trying to be that i just get bored i just need something to be going like okay let's fucking do something you know right. i just get bored i want something to be going on it's like i need to put this energy somewhere so it's interesting because it's like it's spiritual work for you to be writing those songs and to be performing but i feel like it's also spiritual work to be experiencing a king woman show and to like people call it church yeah it's like <laughs> it's like um wasn't it marina abramovic or how do you say her Abram- last name Abram- Abram- abramovic i always I don't say know. it wrong <laughs> the the amazing performance art person yeah, yeah she's um Serbian. so she she did something i forget what the exact story was but there was like some 
museum where people could come in and just like sit and quiet and like yeah. look into her eyes mm -hmm. and people would experience different things. They would cry. They would like, they would have to face whatever comes up when you just like look into someone's soul for a while. I feel that when I go to a King Woman show, like especially well, if you come to Serbian me and like, like, like me, baby, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's something to that. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely an aspect of performance art with what I do, and especially with Nightcrawler. Like, I had some big plans I was going to do before everything got shut down. I definitely want to go more into, like, the performance art aspect of um, of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, like, I was going to do this tour around a few museums in the U.S., but all that oh, shit sick. got... Yeah, all that shit got shut down, so... Like, the... the um, I was going to do some performance art surrounding Let the Children Scream, but, you know... We'll see. Hopefully that'll eventually come back again. I really love, like... The performance aspect of music and I write a lot of my stuff um, as you know with performance in mind you know what I mean especially for things like like Nightcrawler mm -hmm. um, but you know it's just it just takes time to really get the vision in full effect mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of money too for sure you know what I mean and it's like when you have like 10 plus projects it's like a lot of fucking money to get all the shit you want to do in order. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to do all this? Mm -hmm. But hopefully by the end of my lifetime, I'll have accomplished a lot of what I what I really want to accomplish. I want to turn the, the next King Woman record into like a fucking... I want to take it to like fucking theater or Broadway or something. Oh, that'd be so it's cool. like so dramatic. It's about... It's based off of um, John Milton's Paradise Lost. So I want to do something really dramatic with it. I wouldn't even know how to go about doing that, but... I'm definitely going to put some feelers out and see if I can make it happen. <laughs> well, maybe us talking about this yeah. on this podcast. If anybody is listening and wants to write Chris a theater production of a new album, yeah, yeah, yeah. hit her up. Yeah. Hit me up and I'll, uh, I'll send you her email. <laughs> oh, man. Well, what's your, what's your favorite and most profound thing that love has given you in your life? It's just very expansive. I feel like to the to the heights that you can experience love or the pain of love, sometimes it's really painful and um, it destroys you. Um, to the depths that you can feel that that pain and that anguish is is the height of how much joy and happiness I think you can feel. So it just um, I think it can be really expansive if you allow it to be. It just depends on your your perspective. You know, everything is perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it's just changed me as a person. It's it's sh it's shown me my capacity for beauty, and it's beautiful to know that you can f feel that way. Mm -hmm. it, this is a human experience, you know. So we're here having a human experience that is essentially about feeling the rainbow of emotions that we ha we are capable of, and it's it's beautiful to know that I'm capable of feeling these intense feelings. It's it's crazy sometimes, and sometimes I fucking hate it. You know, I'm definitely very emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. And I have to get, you know, hold of that sometimes, but I'll hold on that sometimes. Um, but it's just beautiful to know that I'm capable of such great love. You know, even if someone uh, spits on my love or they don't care about it or they, they think it's worthless, it's like it's just beautiful to know that I'm capable of that kind of emotion mm -hmm. and that kind of power. You know, it's beautiful. It can be beautiful, even though it's sometimes awful. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? How about for you? <laughs> oh, man. There's no greater feeling in the entire world than caring for someone mm -hmm. and watching them blossom in your care. Like yeah. not not that you are the reason that that's happening, mm -hmm. but like when people feel healthy, good love, even if it's not romantic, mm -hmm. like the the strength that they get as a person and the things that they can accomplish and the the courage that they get in life is so much more profound. And I feel like in the greatest parts of relationships when you're in stride with somebody else and you are you're both like watering each other's gardens then that yeah. happens a it's lot it's so beautiful it's trans it definitely transforms you like yeah even okay i'll even say like i had um i had a res got a rescue dog when i lived in san francisco his name was chewy r.i.p chewy what kind so of dog cutest, he was a glen of a mall terrier he was a mutt he was so fucking amazing i got him i think i me and my partner at the time had walked to like a mall because i was like we were casually like oh, i kind of want a dog and I went and I just, there was like a group of dogs and I sat down and he just f collapsed in my lap. And I looked Aww. at my partner at the time and I was like, this is our dog. And he was like, okay. I was like, this is our dog. We're taking this dog. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. And he, it looked like someone had kicked him in the face. He had like a giant scab on his nose and we took him home. 
and he was very standoffish and he would like hide in the corner of the room, wouldn't sleep by us. But over time he started to like get used to us and see and sense that he was safe. And I watched love transform him. Wow. He became a different dog. You know, he would sleep next to me, snore, roll over on me. You know, it's like love. You can watch it in humans and animals alike. Love mm -hmm. really is transformative. It's the most powerful thing on the planet if you, if you allow it to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, like I said before, it's really sad to see how many people have never truly, their souls have never been touched by love. And you can feel it in people. Mm -hmm. You can feel it when they've never experienced love, really. When they have truly never experienced love and they don't have any idea of what it is. You can see, you can see it in the way that they treat other people and yeah. the way that they treat themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like the, I'm, I'm like going through the Rolodex of people that we know that yeah. are like that. I'm like, oh, yep. Yeah, that's... yeah. It's like you can see it when people just literally have no concept of what love is, or they've lost sight of what love is and what life is really about. You know. Mm -hmm. And so all we can do, and sometimes it's hard to love. Sometimes people are shitty to you, and you want to, you know, you're angry or you want to get revenge or you want to live from your ego. And I totally understand that. And a lot of the time love isn't even a feeling it's a choice you know mm -hmm. and same with like committed relationships sometimes you're not feeling like sometimes you lose your attraction for somebody or you don't right. feel like loving them and it's not always like an emotion it's like oh yeah maybe in the honeymoon phase but like it's right. a choice a lot it's, of the time it's a real myth that it's just going to be perfect and amazing yeah. at all times so you have to wake up and go like how am I going to care for this person today so exactly. that we can make each other feel good yeah. and I can bring that love back and I'm going to choose you every day you know mm -hmm. So I don't know, things like marriage and committed relationships. Like to me at this point in my life, I'm 32. I look at that shit and I'm like, that's some serious shit right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's like, not to be taken lightly. No, in any it's way. not. No. And from what I've heard, divorces are really fucking messy. I feel like when I was younger, I would just have a crush on someone and then end up dating them. And then I'd be like, cool, I guess we're together now. And <laughs> like, I would just let things happen. Now I can't even imagine doing that. No, like when you're like an the, adult and you have like shit going on and like you you would need to tie your life to somebody else's life. Yeah, it's a real, it's like some you real understand shit. the power behind it and yeah. and the the decision to choose someone is so much more consequential yeah, than it, can, it used to it be. It can steer the course of your life. You, totally. you end up with the wrong person, you know, or the right person. Yeah, either way. <laughs> true, 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 true. <laughs> True, Cat Jones. Cat Jones, Cat Jones. <laughs> oh, man. I always end these by asking what advice you would give people uh, mm. for love. And that can be for anything like in a relationship, out of relationship, in a breakup, whatever. Like, what do you think would be the most powerful wisdom that you would impart on someone else? <laughs> I, I know I'm really putting I'm you on the, the right, spot. I don't know that I'm the right person to ask about Is this. Is anyone? Kat Jones. Uh, no, I'm playing. Um, I would say, I don't know. You only live once. So, or so, so they, YOLO. Or so, they, or so they say you only live once. I feel like I've been here many times, but. Um, I think you have to. Yeah. Uh, I would say, I don't know. You only live once. You know, if you love somebody or you feel a certain way about some about somebody, it's it's good to let them know. Try to be vulnerable. Write that love letter. You know, tell people how you feel. You know, it's good to be brave when it comes to love, and um, tell people that you care about them, even if it's not romantic. Like, make sure you tell the people around you how much you appreciate them and you love them and you care about them. And if you are in love with someone fucking go for it and if they reject you oh fucking well there's so many people on this planet you'll meet somebody else that will really appreciate your love i would say no one to walk away um and when you're being taken advantage of even if you love somebody you got to respect yourself um be open be open to surprises because you never know what can happen next and <laughs> how love will um will appear to you in your life. I love that. <laughs> and I love you. And I love you, Cat Jones. <laughs> Cat Jones. <laughs> I love that we finally made this happen, even if yeah. it's sitting in my car on the side of the road yeah. in Sacramento. <laughs> Freezing. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, Sacto. Shout out Sacto. This episode of Hot Blooded was hosted, written, and produced by me, Kat Jones. It was edited and co-produced by Evan Dulaney, who, by the way, 
is one of the best drummers I have ever met, and his band Treasure has released a couple of incredible EPs since the last time we did an episode. So you should check them out. Treasure is spelled with a V instead of a U. Don't spell it the regular way, otherwise you won't find them. And the theme song for Hot Blooded was written by Jordan Olds. The logo was made by Corey Largent, who goes by Insane Clam Pasta on Instagram. And additional graphics were made by Jonathan Amaya. The Patreon for this show has been on hiatus since July, and all payments have been paused, but we'll be restarting it on March 1st, and we will be sure to give plenty of notice and updates along the way. Feel free to send us an email anytime at hotbloodedpodcast at gmail.com and head to hotbloodedpodcast.com for all other episodes. See you next time. <laughs>